confuse me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, in my 17 years of living here, I've never seen the masjid this full for Fajr. Allahu Akbar. I prayed by the elevator and I came on time. MashaAllah. Barakallahu feek. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So today we want to talk about high aspirations, aiming high, the idea of aiming as high as you can, raising your standards. Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih in Kitab al-Iman relates from Abu Huraira radiallahu an, who says, Kunna julusan inda Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Unzilat alayhi suratul jum'ah. Abu Huraira relates that one day they were sitting with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Suratul Jum'ah was revealed. And the verse, the specific verse that was revealed, وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ Which means, and others who have not yet joined them. And he is all mighty, all wise. So this verse is verse number three of Surah Al-Jum'ah. Verse two, the verse right before it, uh, Allah says, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعْثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Allah says, He is the one who sent among the unlettered people the Prophet to recite to them the scripture to purify them, to teach them the book and the wisdom. And prior to that, they were not guided. So this is an important verse that teaches us the mission of the messenger and the fact that he was sent to his people, al-ummiyin, the unlettered ones. And he was sent in order to convey the revelation, the signs of Allah to them, to teach them the book of Allah and the wisdom, and generally to perform the tazkiyah. But then the next verse says, وَآخَرِينَ And others. What is this going back to, the others? Or the sentence, what is it going back to? The prior verse says, He, Allah, is the one who sent among the unlettered people a messenger. The second verse means it's a continuation. He, Allah, is the one who sent the messenger among others. So the question is, who are the others? The first ones are the Ummiyin. This is the audience, the immediate audience of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The people of Mecca and Medina and his, you know, surrounding regions. But then the next verse, وَآخَرِينَ Those others who have not yet joined them. So when this verse was revealed and the Prophet conveyed it to the people, Abu Huraira says, قَالُوا مَنْ هُمْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ they asked him, who are they, O Messenger of Allah? فَلَمْ يُرَاجِعْهُ He did not answer. فَسَأَلُوهُ ثَلَاثًا They asked again to a total of three times. And he did not answer. And then he gave his answer in his way. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a master teacher. So what did he do? And Abu Huraira says, وَفِينَا سَلْمَانَ الْفَارِسِي he says, among our audience was Salman al-Farisi. Why is he relating that detail? Because of the next part. So he's, they said, فَوَضَعَ يَدَهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى سَلْمَانِ So the Prophet, he put his hand on Salman. So he didn't answer the question yet. So this is his answer. He took his hand, he put it on the thigh of Salman al-Farisi, رضي الله عنه. And he says something beautiful. He said, لَوْ كَانَ الْإِيمَانُ عِنْدَ الثُرَيَّةِ لَنَا لَهُ رِجَالٌ مِّنْ هَاُولَىٰ He says, if, he said, if Iman or faith was as far away as a thurayya, thurayya is one of the stars. If Iman was as far away as thurayya, his people would reach it. لَنَا لَهُ رِجَالٌ مِّنْ هَاُولَىٰ So he's speaking about Salman. Who is Salman? 
Al-Farisi. He was non-Arab. He came from Persia, Farsi, that those lands, Khurasan, the greater Khurasan region. So he, the Prophet wasallam, used the metaphor of Thuraya. Thuraya is the Pleiades const uh, constellation of stars. It's a cluster of stars also known as the Seven Sisters. Every culture refers to this star. Uh, among the Persians, they call it Parveen. But we have an Arabic and also an Urdu Thuraya. And it's one of the stars that's most visible to most people on the planet. So it was used as a metaphor for excellence, for something very far away. So there are many, many sayings in Arabic. For instance, there's Kun Rajulan, Rijluhu fi Thara, Wahamatu Himmatihi fi Thuraya. So the Thara in Arabic means the ground. Thuraya is the star that we're talking about. So there's a saying, be like a man whose feet are on the ground, but whose ambitions are in the heavens, in, among Thuraya, as far away as the star. This is a great saying, teaching us to be, you know, people of high aspirations, or Luwul Himma. So anyway, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used this metaphor. And he says, Iman, if it was as far away as Thuraya, his people would reach it. What a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is it teaching us? It's teaching us how the Prophet was close to his companions, how he was inclusive. Sometimes when you're in a community of similar people, you tend to exclude others, not intentionally, but it happens. So this is a community of proud Arabs. There are different tribes. It's a tribalistic society. When you're not from that culture, those tribes, you don't really fit in. But look how the Prophet Sallallahu he looked at the outsiders, someone like Salman, who had no tribe no family, and he always kept him close. And he used this metaphor that Iman, if it was as far away as Thuraya, the people of Salman would reach it. They would surely attain it. That was the answer to the question of this verse. وَآخَرِينَ Who are the others? وَآخَرِينَ مِنْهُمْ لَمَّا يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ The companions asked, who are these others that Allah is referring to in the Quran? And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just gave an example by putting his hand on Salman and he said these beautiful words. So, who are these people? These people are the people of Salman. Immediately, it's the Persians, the people of Salman. But broadly speaking, you can say it's the people who are outside of the Arabian Peninsula, people who are non-Arabs. So this is so uh, inspiring and so amazing. This is how this verse was revealed and this is what it's speaking about. And if you look at, if dig deeper into this metaphor, look at the, um, the insight, the prediction of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, Islam was revealed in Hijaz, right? The Quran was revealed among the Quraysh in an Arabic language. And initial Muslims were predominantly Arab. But within one generation, Islam went east and it went west to Africa, it went east to the Persian lands primarily, went north to the Roman lands. And so many Muslims from different cultures came into the fold of the Ummah. But just to think about the people of Salman, if you look at the influence of the Persians on our heritage, on our culture, on the Islamic tradition, it is unimaginable. If you take anything, start, let's start with the Quran. The Quran today was recited by Imam Rauf in the Riwayat Hafsan Asim. There are different traditions of reciting Quran. If you're from Morocco, you'll be reciting Quran by Warsh and Nafir. But the 98% of the Muslim Ummah recites Quran through the teaching of Imam Asim. And the name of our recitation, Imam uh, Riwayat Hafsan Asim. Asim was Persian. How many people know that? The way we read Quran today goes back to a Persian by the, for the majority of people. In ethnicity, he was Persian. There were ten great teachers of Quran. Three of them were Persian, of Persian descent. And the one most people follow today in recitation, he was Farisi. If you look at fiqh, you know, the, the most followed legal school in the Muslim world, and perhaps most people in this community follow that school, is a school of Imam Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa was Persian, Farisi. So the mo most widely followed fiqh school in the world today goes back to someone whose per ethnicity was Persian. If you look in Arabic language, in Arabic language is amazing. 
Arabic grammar, there are two schools in Arabic grammar, the Kufan school and the Basran school. The Basran school was founded by Sibawe. He was Persian. The Kufan school was founded by Kisai. He was also Persian. So Arabic grammar itself, the schools of Arabic grammar, the codification of Arabic grammar by Persians. If you look at Arabic dictionary, the best Arabic dictionaries, Allama Raghib al-Isfahani, he was from Isfahan, Persia, and so many others, Fayruz Abadi, uh, Zamakhshari, all the great dictionaries, many of them were written, compiled by Persian. So this is the service of the people of Salman to the Ummah. And there's no place where you find this service more than in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. In the hadith, we know the canonical books of hadith. How many are there? Six books that are the most widely read books of hadith. Among them, the most authentic is, without a doubt, what is the most authentic book of hadith? Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam Bukhari was from where? Bukhara. He was Persian. So the most authentic book of hadith in our tradition is by Imam al-Bukhari, who was Persian. He was from Bukhara, which today is in Uzbekistan. And then if you look at, okay, you might say, okay, that's the most authentic, but we'll have others. But if you look at the others, actually the six books of hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, and Nasai, Ibn Majah, all six were Persian, every single one of them. Bukhari was from present-day uh, Uzbekistan, Muslim from um, present-day Iran, Abu Dawood from Afghanistan, Sijistan, which is a region in the north of Afghanistan where they speak Farsi, and so on and so forth. Every single one of them were people who were the people of Salman. So this is, when you think about that day when Abu Huraira was sitting there, and the Prophet put his hand on Salman and he said those words, just fast forward 200 years later, you know, the, the field that has the most imprint of the Persians is a field of hadith. So the same messenger who put his hand on Salman, his people served the hadith of that messenger the most, more than anyone else. So this is a great uh, example for us. What high aspirations mean. High aspirations, they don't come easy. So it's not just something that these people were born with. They were non-Arabs. They learned the Arabic language. They struggled. And if you look at their struggles, that's a whole different topic. The amount of struggles they went through is immense. It's unbelievable, unimaginable. So you think about Thuraya, how far Thuraya is, 444 light years away from the earth. But if you look at the struggles of these individuals, what they went through to preserve the hadith, what they went through in terms, it's unimaginable, it's unbelievable. I'll just share, I'll end by sharing with you just one of these scholars, Abu Hatim al-Razi, one of the great scholars who is Persian, one of the hadith experts, he wrote in his journal how he learned hadith and what he went through. And when you read this, it's really remarkable. There's, there's nothing you can find in history of humanity that parallels this. So he writes about his early journey in hadith and learning hadith. He says, The first time I went out to learn hadith, I spent about seven years. And he said, أَحْسَيْتُ مَا مَشَيْتُ عَلَىٰ قَدَمِي زِيَادَةْ عَلَىٰ فَرْسَخْ He says, I counted my steps. And they used to walk back then. Some of them had animals or rides or mount, uh, mounts. Many of them walked. So Abu Hatim al-Razi, he says, um, I walked. And I started counting my steps. And in those days, you know, farsakh was a measure of distance. It's called a league. It's roughly like a thousand steps. So what is it equivalent to? If you equivalent, uh, for in today's era, one farsakh or one league is about, I believe three kilometers if I'm not mistaken. I don't see the footnote in my notes. But he walked a thousand farsakh. And he said, after a thousand I got tired, I stopped counting. So that's a thousand farsakh is almost 3,000 miles, you know. So he says, and then he continues his, his, his journey. He says, I could not recall how many times I walked from Kufa to Baghdad. Kufa to Baghdad is 32 miles. If you Google it and just do a pedestrian map, it takes 31 hours. 
He says, I did multiple times walking from Kufa to Baghdad. He said, I did not count how many times I walked from Mecca to Medina. Mecca to Medina, we make Umrah today, we take the bus, it takes what, four or five hours. The new high speed train, an hour and a half. Imagine walking between Mecca and Medina. He did it multiple times, 311 miles. He said, I once left Bahrain near the city of Silla, walked all the way to Egypt, and from Egypt to Ramla in Palestine, that's 460 miles walking. And then he said, from Ramla to Asqalan, Ramla to Tiberias, Tiberias to Damascus, and he details all the cities that he walked. And he, sa he says at the end, and I'll just end with that, he says all the way at the end, He says, Kullu dhalika mashian. In the end of his journey, he says, All of this that I documented was walking. None of it on an animal. Kullu dhalika mashian. Kullu hadha fi safari al awwal. And all of this is in my first journey. He had many journeys after that. This was just his first journey. Wa ana ibn ashrina sana. And I was 20 years old. So this is the first journey of Abu Hatim al Razi, age is 20. All of this is done walking. He says, Ajulu Sabah Sinin. His whole journey lasted seven years. This is just one example. One scholar, Imam Bukhari, has similar examples of his traveling all around the world. If you just document that in the maps, it's mind boggling. There's no way anybody can do that today. It's unimaginable how that was done. Perhaps it goes back to the barakah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said, Lokan al Iman wa inda Thurayya. May Allah give us high aspirations in our times today. May we raise our standards and aim for the stars as they say. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.